Just after midday on May 26, 1971, Australian authorities received a call from a mysterious man claiming that a Qantas flight from Sydney to Hong Kong was carrying a bomb, placing the lives of those on board in serious jeopardy. The man identified himself as Mr. Brown and warned that the bomb would automatically explode when the aircraft dipped below 6,500 meters. He then claimed that he would disclose the location of the onboard bomb in return for a hefty sum of 500,000 Australian dollars, equivalent to roughly 560,000 US dollars at the time. Adjusted for inflation, that would be a little over $3 million in today's money. In 1971, mankind had not discovered YouTube yet, but pranksters weren't something unheard of, so at first, authorities were skeptical. But the alleged Mr. Brown wasn't just goofing around. He had put a contingency plan in place for this very event. He directed police and Qantas officials to a locker in the Sydney airport. He claimed that this locker contained an identical bomb to the one on board the aircraft, providing proof that his deadly claims were indeed to be believed. When the bomb squad opened the locker, they found a vinyl bag. Inside the vinyl bag, a bomb which was very real and very dangerous. It contained an altitude detector set to detonate at 1500 meters. Authorities decided to put this altitude detector to the test, and the only way to do it was to take it to the skies. They did so by replacing the explosives with a light bulb. If the device was real, the light bulb would illuminate when descending beneath 1500 meters. A Boeing 747 then went skyward with the device on board. The craft climbed to over 2,000 meters before beginning a descent to check if Mr. Brown's device would actually work as planned. When the 747 descended to 1,500 meters, the light bulb illuminated. It was true. The device could measure altitude, meaning the device on board the other plane was very capable of exploding when it reached 6,500 meters. Qantas decided to submit to Mr. Brown's demands. It was the only logical thing to do. A commercial airplane may itself cost hundreds of millions of dollars, not to mention the lives of the 133 people on board that could be saved. $500,000 in $20 bills from the Commonwealth Bank were brought to the Qantas HQ. The serial numbers were recorded and the cash was packed into two suitcases. Mr. Brown arrived at the Qantas headquarters in a combi van wearing a fake beard. General Manager Captain Ritchie then pushed suitcases through the van window, all of them stuffed with bundles of cash. In line with his demands, Mr. Brown was handed a huge sum of $500,000. Fifteen minutes later, the same van was found on a street corner, abandoned. Mr. Brown had made a fast getaway. This event brought great embarrassment to the Australian police. Their very well laid plan had completely failed to catch Mr. Brown or even put him on surveillance. While this saga on the ground had been occurring, there had been plenty of drama in the air. The plane had been redirected back towards Sydney, with passengers on board told that the craft was suffering from a quote, technical fault. The plane circled around the Botany Bay area of Sydney, awaiting information from the ground. None was forthcoming, and the fuel level on board was becoming dangerously low. The military, anticipating disaster, deployed aircraft and navy vessels. Back on board the flight, the plane crew searched the entire craft for the device. The passengers began to realize that the crew were looking for a bomb, but none of the staff on board would admit it. The staff on board the flight were stuck in a difficult situation, reluctant to keep flying because of fuel levels, but unable to land because of the bomb on board. But before disaster struck, Mr. Brown, who had now received his cash, called Qantas once again to reveal one more unexpected twist in the plot. He told officials, you can relax. There's no bomb on board the plane. You can land her safely. With no other option but to trust Mr. Brown, the flight team lowered the plane to the ground. And in doing so, they proved Mr. Brown's final words of the day to be true. There was no explosion, there was no disaster, and there was no bomb. The entire plot had been a hoax, and the alleged Mr. Brown had managed to swindle half a million dollars. Mr. Brown's revelation had come in good time. The fuel tank had only around 15 minutes of flight time remaining. A mere 15 minutes more time in the air would have sent the craft crashing to the ground. From that point, the hunt was on for Mr. Brown. Police hoped to find the true identity of the man, working under the assumption that the hoaxer had used an alias. In the hunt for the culprit, they even had a full replica of the man made, offering five
$5,000 for help in his arrest. The detectives worked alongside Scotland Yard, Interpol, and the FBI in a bid to narrow down the list of suspects, but none of this actually worked. It wasn't long before Mr. Brown was found, but because of his own stupidity. In August of the same year, three months after the hoax, police discovered Mr. Brown's true identity. His real name was Peter Macari, and he was from England. He'd arrived in Australia two years earlier, having fled England after skipping bail on a charge of indecent assault. Having lost $25,000, which was half of his savings, he began to travel. One night while sitting in a motel room, he saw a movie that would change his life forever. That movie was Doomsday Flight, released in 1966, five years prior to the hoax. In the movie, a criminal plants a bomb on board an airplane, with the device set to detonate when the plane reaches a certain altitude. The criminal who planted the bomb demands a ransom in exchange for the safety of those on board. Sound familiar? Had he been a little more conservative with his ill-gotten gains, Macari might have gotten away with the crime. But he and his accomplice were unable to resist the temptation to splash their cash lavishly. This accomplice was Raymond Pointing, who taught Macari how to use explosives, then sold him some of the dangerous devices. Macari paid Pointing $50,000 for his role in the plot. Both men spent their money recklessly and erroneously. First, Macari bought two cars, including a Jaguar, along with a penthouse at Bondi Beach. He then bought a car for Pointing, who couldn't even drive. Pointing decided to get his license before buying a second car and purchasing the Jaguar from Macari. These purchases drew attention. A service station attendant was suspicious of Macari's newfound cash and rang the police, which led to the arrests of both men. Of the $500,000, $138,000 was found behind a wall in an old fireplace. Around $250,000 more was never recovered. The rest had been spent. When asked about the missing $250,000, Macari spun authorities a tale of a wider, criminal network that he had unwittingly been roped into. He claimed that a third man, the real mastermind, had taken the lion's share of the ransom for himself. Police and the court didn't buy his story, and the whereabouts of the missing part of the ransom remained a mystery. Some believe that Macari might have hid the money somewhere to retrieve it later. Pointing received a seven-year jail term, while Macari received 15 years. However, Macari was extradited from Australia nine years after starting his sentence. Upon his return to England, he began running a fish and chip shop in the southern part of the country. In 1986, history came full circle when a movie was made based upon the heist. Titled Call Me Mr. Brown, the movie copied the heist which had itself mimicked a movie. So. What happened to the missing $250,000? We may never know, but what we do know is that we must secure our precious belongings from new age thieves and scammers. What could be more precious than your online passwords and credit card details? That's why you should never use simple passwords like this or this for your online accounts. They can be cracked in less than an hour. Similarly, you should never use one password for more than one account, otherwise all your accounts may fall into danger if any one of them gets compromised. But of course, remembering a unique and complex password for each account is tedious, and that's why I've brought Dashlane to you. Dashlane is an application that remembers all of your passwords, stores them in a safe place, and autofills them when you want to log on. Because you no longer need to remember any password, you can keep extremely complex, unique passwords for all of your accounts that are almost impossible to break. You can start with Dashlane for absolutely free at dashlane.com slash sidenote. And if you like the service, you can get the premium features like syncing across platforms, free VPN, secure safe for your notes and documents at 10% off by using the offer code sidenote. Hi everyone, I'm Alec Belmore, and I narrate videos for Sidenote. I've got a channel of my own that you can check out using the link in the description. Thanks for watching.